Hey Kelly, thank you so much for joining me today. It's great to see you again. Thanks for having me. Lovely to see you too. Um, so yeah, I guess we wanted to cover a couple of topics today. First of all is that you, you are still, um, Open Residential Reports is still out working, helping their customers. Yes, we are. Um, we've obviously got to be very careful about observing particular rules and regulations when we're out there. Um, and uh, so we've really just worked with our inspectors and our clients to make sure that we practice social distancing, that all our equipment is cleaned regularly and that everyone's wearing gloves and masks as, as required. Um, and, uh, and yes, we're still, as part of mandatory disclosure, we've got to be out there doing our jobs and the listings are still happening, so we're still working. Yeah, business is, is still going on in, um, in these unprecedented times. Yes, absolutely. So two topics that we um, just had a discussion about before that come up a lot for you and are common questions, so we thought we'd cover it is um, building approvals and also energy ratings. So let's start with the difference of energy ratings when um, at the moment, you know, for an established property, the, the maximum you can get is a six, but you know, there's properties out there that are being advertised with, you know, 8.2 or 9, all these different kind of energy ratings. What is the difference and what is happening now? So, um, when a property is uh, assessed on a on an on off plan yep. before it's built, it's assessed using a second generation um, piece of software, uh, energy efficiency rating tool, um, and that can rate to a ten. So, and in in uh, in most instances, in fact, I think in all instances, a new build has to rate to a six. So, the minimum that you're looking for is a six, and most properties achieve a higher rating than that. So. That would be for the, the first energy rating that is produced for the property, anything new, it will have a higher than six rating. When you come to resell that property, um, so the law is that as soon as that property has been lived in, um, it needs to be assessed again. However, it's assessed on a first generation tool, predominantly the tool that's used is called first rate four. Um, and that tool will physically only rate to a six. So, whilst similar elements are put into both tools one is more sophisticated than the other one um, the first rate first generation tool that we are obliged to use um, will only rate that same eight star property to us to you know potentially a five star or a four and a half star property um, and we do find although we include information for our um, readers to make sure that they're informed of the fact that their rating hasn't actually dropped mm -hmm. um, it's in, Important that you know it's nice to be able to work with the vendor to understand those because it is difficult when you when you all of a sudden think you're being penalized yeah. um, it's really important that we communicate to vendors that you're not that this is a level playing field that no matter anyone with the same property would have been rated the same on their first generation tool um, and that certain elements aren't taken into account you know so beautiful solar passive houses that have had some incredibly wonderful design elements they simply, those pieces of data simply can't be put into a first rate, first generation tool. So then I guess it comes down to working with your real estate agent on how you market those additional features of the building. So although you've got an energy rating, to be able to also address with your purchasers that there are particular um, elements of the building that are really important to, uh, you know, uh, solar panels and, and solar passive um, design. And there's all sorts of features that, that can be marketed um, so that you can still communicate the value of that to your buyer. Yeah, so people spend that more doing those investments in that. Um, we will still make sure that they're covered, but yeah, they need to be aware that it's not going to be um, showing as the same energy rating as when they, when they designed it originally. Yes, but we do make sure that we really clearly communicate that to their readers. And I think also now solicitors are across it too. So I think most parties or most professionals involved in the real estate industry understand it. So they're able to alleviate any concerns along the way as well. Yeah, no, that's that's very good. And I'm sure something that a lot of people get a lot of use out of. Um, the second part is the biggest thing we come across is um, unapproved structures. And I think there's um, it's very rarely that I come across a, a house in Canberra that doesn't have some form of unapproved structures. Um, right. All we want to talk about is people are home now more and maybe now is a good time to, if they've been thinking of making a move, get through the process of, of getting approvals um, and, and how you are able to, there at Residential Reports, able to assist people in that process as well. 
Yeah. So for a pre-sale report um, and mandatory disclosure, the two areas of approvals that have to be addressed is building and development approval. So um, it's not, you know, we don't look at plumbing or electrical and that's simply because they obviously require a specialised service. They're not required as part of the contract. And also that information isn't actually released on the building file. So we're not able to comment on it because we're not given the data. Um, but building and development approval, ultimately, you know, in simple terms, any structure at all that's on the block, um, if it's if it's on plan with a certificate of occupancy, then it's been approved. Um, and if, and if, it, if, it, if it's not on plan, the chances are that it's not approved. And then there's a certain uh, amount of, um, uh, certain elements that have to be considered as to determine whether it requires approval or not. You know, certain heights, garden beds, uh, removable structures, there's all sorts of exemptions that um, we obviously have to look at and consider and communicate in our document um, so that, you know, a low level garden bed that's been built well by a, a vendor is not, you know, considered an unapproved structure. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, we see, we see lots of situations where you might have a swimming pool or a, um, an extension or a, a significant structure where the paperwork trail or the paper trail has begun on the building file. And you might even see a document called a building approval letter um, and and fair enough, the layperson may read that and think that they've got approval. Um, ultimately, that happened. That has happened quite frequently in, in years gone by. Um, and you'll find a, a building approval letter from 1978 and no certificate of occupancy in use. And that means that the process actually wasn't finished. So what we do is we will work with the vendor to um, firstly determine if there are any unapproved structures. Then obviously the real estate agent has to decide whether or not it's it's necessary to go down the path of looking at approvals because there's many cases where selling with an unapproved structure is perfectly acceptable. Um, you know, it just depends on the size, the, um, the, you know, what that element is and whether or not they think it's going to be a concern during the sales process. Um, and then uh, we would work with a vendor to firstly look at the paper trail that we've already got um and to see what needs to be done to finish that approval process but to give you a basic example you might have a situation where you've got a really large unapproved deck and pergola that's very, very well built and structurally sound so it, what we would do is we would engage our certifier and our um, all of our other service providers draftsmen builders structural engineers that all are required to sign off on that structure and then they go through the motions of putting in their pieces of paper to the certifier um, and ultimately that is then um, submitted to ACLA and an approval is granted. And for a normal building approval, if there's no remedial works, you might look at uh, up maybe six weeks, four to six weeks for approval, um, just depending on service providers. But it, you know, we find it's a pretty straightforward process. Okay, well that's great because yeah, a lot of people are home now and um, sort of working through those those lists. I know myself of, of jobs to do where you're like, okay, I'll do this when I get time, but now yes. people are home, they've got a chance to have someone come around and have a look whether they're thinking of selling or just want to get everything ticked off. Um, you're able to, to assist them with that. So Yeah, and I think, you know, just from a practical perspective, if vendors are walking around their house and doing their own general maintenance list, mm -hmm before they before the building inspectors called in if they do have an intention of repairing things and making sure that the property is up to scratch if that's their intention then most people if you're practical will observe the thing, same things that a building inspector will observe at a visual level you know obviously there's no expectation that you know we do an extensive sub subfloor check and we do and you know roof cavities and we're looking at unapproved structures and they're things that obviously are specialised. But just in terms of general maintenance, um, there's a lot that you can do yourself to make sure that you're well prepared before your building inspector comes through, you know. And if you, if because we have to report on the building as it stands on the day, we have a legal obligation, um, you know, we can have a conversation and someone can say, oh yeah, I'm getting to that, but we still have to report it as it's seen on the day. So. If you have the intention of getting a plumber through to fix a dripping toilet or a leaking tap, um, or you have, you know, if there's any remedial works that you're intending on doing, get them done first. That's absolutely the rule of thumb. 
Yeah, and definitely now is a great time. I think all the reports are coming out in the news that everyone's, um, you know, hitting up Bunnings and getting the paint and getting the gardens done and those kind of things. So yeah, now is a great time to get the property ready before you guys come out. Um, call in the trades for the, the important ones and, you know, um, and do your touch up painting yourself before, um, before you guys come out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Kelly. I'm sure we will catch up again um, and some more people raise some questions, but I think there's some really great insight from your wealth of knowledge uh, on some of the big things that, that people do ask. So thank you so much and um, have a wonderful day. Thanks a million, Sarah. Lovely to speak to you. Bye.